Well, hey there, Pete. Oh, hi, Dodge. I didn't see you there. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to talk about Lynn McTaggart and that that wild and galloping conversation I just had with her not so long ago. Here, here's what here's where I'd like to start. I'd like to make it about me, if you don't well, let's mind. Make it about you. <laughs> Because really, I think that's what we're here I, to talk about. I think that I am. Am I? I'm just genuinely not optimistic enough to have those kinds of conversations. Is that possible? Well, it's certainly possible for today. I don't know <laughs> that it's something you'd want to commit to as like a lifelong reality. But um, maybe it's just so that for right now, having this idea that. Like any of what she just said might be true is just a really uncomfortable. Is that possible? It's re- it's it's really uncomfortable. I think I'm too. I think I'm just not wired this way. I'm just not wired this way. Like the and and I think it's that the sources that I tend to trust spend a lot of time debunking stuff like Lynn's, and yeah. so. I already approach conversations like this with a degree of bias that is very difficult to shake. And what I mean, what people don't know is you and I have spent the last hour talking <laughs> together about how how to <laughs> how talk, are we about, talk this about this <laughs> because it's really hard for me. It like breaks my brain to have this kind of conversation. And you said something that 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 hit home for me, and it's. It is um, it means a lot that well, I'm going to butcher it. It was about what you want for the platform of this show. Can you say it again? Do you even remember? Yeah, I think I do. Let me see if I can like back back up a little bit and then walk into what I was trying to say there. I'm a really big believer that opposing energies are healthy things. Gas pedals work better if there's a brake pedal right next to them. Brake pedals work a whole lot better if there's a gas pedal next to them. Like, we need some of that. Um, And it's a healthy thing to to have our sort of feet on the ground and be willing to squint once in a while, even at somebody we really like, even at an idea we desperately hope is true, and kind of go, huh, is that Mm -hmm. really true? Can we believe this stuff? Is that – is this maybe just nonsense or something? Yeah. Um, I think our world is doing a pretty good job of a lot of that. There are a whole lot of scientists who are moving very methodically, very slowly to understand virtually ineffable things. And they should be. And there is no way in the world we could take anything we just heard from Lynn McTaggart as proof. No way. Even she wouldn't do that. And shoot, she's got a financial interest in that. She's not saying that. She's certainly not saying it in the book. Um, I'm really interested in having a show that raises powerful questions. One of the great sort of teachers and mentors of my life uh, is a guy named Jerry Campbell that we're going to have on the show again someday soon. Not again, but for the first time sometime soon. And Um, He said something to me a long time ago. He said, you know, people are fundamentally oriented toward questions or fundamentally oriented toward answers. And they're both great. And they both have got some drawbacks. And I am definitely a natural question asker. I live in them. I think the questions themselves make us move. It's not just the answers. In fact, it's it's uh, maybe even less the answers than the questions that really move us forward. So I'm interested in a show that raises really freaking fascinating possibilities, even if we don't know that they're true. I'm not worried about being the part of the world that's tasked with finally locking down the final answer on whether this is or isn't a permanent constant as a reality. Because I think... Most of the time, in my experience, and this tends to be true for question askers, there is no permanent constant reality about freaking anything. The answer is always, well, it depends. Do thoughts have immense power all by themselves? Well, it depends. We can point to all kinds of places where they have. 
Gandhi or Martin Luther King did nothing but prevent, pre present a really powerful thought and it captured the world's imagination. Does that count? Well, yeah, a lot of people would say, sure, that counts, but you can't have them if you're just having the thought by yourself. Well, maybe, maybe not. There's a whole lot of evidence that it changes your physiology quite profoundly. I'd really like to have that Harvard expert on the placebo effect come on the show because recently one of the things he's found, or at least somebody has found, I can't remember if it was out of his his research workshop or not, but they found that placebos literally change the shape of your brain. And they even work when you know they're placebos. <laughs> what is going on there? If you tell someone this is just a sugar pill, it's not going to help, um, it will help anyway for a whole lot of the people. So something's going on out there, most likely. And I'm really interested in being a place where we get super curious about the questions that somebody's work can bring up. And Lynn McTaggart, I don't think, comes up with a whole lot of final answers that I would bet my retirement on anywhere. But boy, does she come up with some really interesting questions and just enough evidence to make us all scratch our heads and go, wait a minute, that's weird. What's that about? And that's why I liked having her on the show. I uh, I, I think you guys had a great conversation and um, and it was hard. It was hard to to listen to in a lot of places, again, because it's just how I'm wired. There are a couple of things. I, I really don't want this to be um, a, a platform for you and I just to disagree on the merits of the, you know, of, of her research or, or whatever. I, I would say that uh, she's a controversial figure. Uh, she's not herself a scientist, and that already sets her up as a as somebody who is, you know, has put a target on her own back. Right. Because yeah. and, and often, you know, when you talk about like, you know, pioneers taking the most shots like there, that is absolutely um, the case. She's put herself in a position to be openly, publicly curious about things that challenge a lot of people like me and like other people who actually are scientists and uh, have trouble with it. And I get that. Uh, you look for, you do, it, you know, don't even bother. You do some search for her. You know, she's a controversial figure online and it will just take that as, as table stakes and, and then move on. I, I think there are people who make a good case that some of the things can be construed as guidance that she is observing and those things can be dangerous in certain contexts. And those are the things that I'm afraid of. To your point, what sometimes scares me about asking questions and being a question answer asker is that I feel like my observation more cynically is that I know what people do with unresolved questions right we have too much evidence of in of the media having too much sort of control and power over you know signals that people choose to believe and doing things that are dangerous for themselves right in in mass media and politics and social media like it is it it we live in a very complex landscape so all that said uh there are some things that that are provocative for me in this conversation for sure uh, and so I'm I'm doing my best to do something that you do so well, which is to compartmentalize, <laughs> right? <laughs> compartmentalize the complexity that I am living through right now. So, yeah, yeah. Let me speak to some of that. First of all, let me just completely join you. Uh, I, I was when I think of myself as a question asker, that isn't to say I don't also like some good answers sometimes. And I don't eventually, as I go through my wave, arrive at a place where I feel pretty dang comfortable with at least some general <laughs> direction of an answer at the very least. And so let's take one example of where questions can get scary. Um, I think questions were used and weaponized in ways that kept the tobacco industry making people sick for way too long by questioning the research that tobacco was harmful to people. Right. Like the same thing has happened, I think, in my opinion, an expert as that may be, around climate change. I think the scientists generally have come to quite a consensus that this is a real thing and humans have something to do with it. Generally speaking, we probably really need to be taking some action on that. and. 
raising lots of doubts about it right now is not very helpful. Um, so th I think there are places where Lynn is out there working. Uh, she's also interested in kind of the health sphere, and she may be asking questions over there that um, that people get more nervous about. But this show is really very much about an aspect of her work that is about this idea that um, groups of people holding a thought together seem to have influence in a way we would expect on a tiny, tiny level scientifically, but seem to also have an effect on a material, visible level um, that she can't prove, but she's at least providing um, a vehicle for studying. And the funny thing is, no scientist could do this without her, at least not on the scale she's doing it. A scientist could get 10 people in a room, but couldn't get 10,000 online because you need a freaking following, and scientists are very busy not having a following. Yeah, right. They don't want a following. That's going to bias them. It's going to screw things up. It's going to divide their, you know, motives and all of those things. And so they're wise. Um, what I appreciated about her approach is, as I've understood it over the books I've read of hers, and it's really hard to convey this in only 90 minutes talking to somebody because a book is a whole lot longer than that. I mean, it's what, 10 hours of material if you were to read it straight through out loud or something, um, is she's saying, well, I've got a whole lot of people who are interested in this because they've read you know, some of my books before. Could I go to a scientist and say, hey, you know how to create a study like this. I can provide the people. Could you provide a study? Could you – do you believe in this? Some of them would say yes. Some of them would say absolutely not. And then she would say, well, could you design a study that would make you want to believe in it or more inclined to believe in it if you got the right results? And they would say, yeah, I think I could do that. And she'll say, great. You set it up. You do all the measurements. All I'll they all I will do is provide the people. I think that's a pretty good setup for at least the beginnings of getting interested in can we change the pH water of a lake? Can we make seeds grow faster? Can we change the violence level of a neighborhood? Um, and she's gotten enough at least interesting results out there to make for some really fun questions. So in terms of what you were looking to get out of the conversation that you had with Lynn uh, last week, what uh, do you feel like you do you feel like you you got there? Do you feel like you accomplished it knowing full well that it's a survey that was too too shallow given the the source material? Uh, yeah. do, you, do you feel good? What you what'd you learn? That's a great question. Um, well, let me start with what I wish we'd had more time for. Um, that I, I kind of my my priorities have changed since then, in part because of our conversations and your discomfort. And you're you're literally educated as a journalist, and uh, and as a my question asking as a psychologist is sort of different. I am. Uh, I've got a kind of a different motive. But I wish we had spent a little bit more time on the controversy. I wish I'd given her a platform to say, what do you say to the folks who th thinks that this is either ridiculous or dangerous? You know, what would what would you say about those those things? Because it would have been neat to give her a chance to at least answer that. Um, and I didn't walk in, though, wanting to put her on the spot. What I was mostly interested in, in was could we – get folks curious about this possibility that their thoughts have quite a lot of power in their lives, not just to change their moods or their physiology, but potentially to change, you know, their experience on a bigger level and to even change other people's experience. And I thought she spoke to that. I was really interested in the paradoxical element of, of this, as we tend to be on this show, where she was saying, um, who knows how much, how in the world we may or may not have been affecting the rate of growth of these seeds. That's not my area of expertise, but we're giving that a shot to see what we could come up with. What was really curious for her was how many years of 
feedback she was getting from people before she started saying, what is going on here that people keep telling me that when they participate in these studies, big things happen for them? What's that about? I'm curious about that too. Why is it that the more they seem to give away peace, the more peace they seem to get? What is going on there? What Lynn and I didn't talk about in the version of the show that we've, you know, are going to release is that I had some experience with this because I participated in that year long study. Yeah. And I have stayed in touch with the, the folks for the last now six years and still reach out to them, you know, to work on stuff. And I do find she is on to something that when I participate looking to get something just for myself, I get way less than when I participate looking to give something to them. I don't know what that's about. It's curious to me. I remember writing that, though, in some of my surveyed stuff, that um, there is something else going on here than just having them work on me and it having a weirdly powerful impact on my life. There's something going on here where the more I work on them, the more I seem to get what I give. And I don't know what to make of that. The question, you know, the cynical question is, do you think you, I mean, when you put that kind of focused work on yourself, and we know already there's fantastic research that exists around like what happens when, uh, you know, that you hormonally and chemically inside when you are um, existing in a spirit of, you know, joy or jubilance or, you know, from your uh, it just it's a good thing. Right. You, you smile mm -hmm. and smile creates triggers in your chemical triggers in your body that improve your your mood, your disposition, your health, right? All of that stuff is, we know that. Mm -hmm. Is is your act of personal intention triggering that? Do you need these other people? Do you, Or is it that you need knowing that they're out there at the same time doing the same thing uh, to accelerate that in yourself or, you know, I, I, you know, is there, is there something else that's a part of that, that you could have done, you could have done alone or yeah, good. speaking to, speaking to placebos, could you have just told yourself real hard that there are a lot of people out there wishing or, or, you know, intending at the same time and they, and have that same experience. I'm not sure how many yeses I just racked up, but let's call it three or four of them. <laughs> All of those sounded like yeses to me. Um, and uh, let me just see how many of those I can remember. Um, interestingly, in the book, and we didn't get to spend enough time on this at all, she goes into a bunch of science that might explain what's going on here. So she goes into polyvagal theory where we're looking at, you know, this idea of like what's happening when you stimulate the vagus nerves and and or the vagus nerve and what what kinds of things internally stimulate the vagus nerve and how many ways does that make you feel wonderful. She also looks at some really neat research on altruism. Like when you are even in a headspace of trying to give to others, what happens in your life? And the results are freaking cool and they're really, really weird. Yeah, um, I can't speak to those results, but I know that when I am giving my time to others or organizations or donating or, or being just genuinely charitable, it's a straight up addiction. It feels really good. Doesn't it, it just feels good. It triggers that same sort of hormone chemical thing that that just feels good. Yep. And there is great research out there, and I can't remember how much of this she covered in her book and how much of this is stuff I've read elsewhere, but I want to talk about it now, which is the difference between empathy and loving kindness. They did this neat study where they showed a series of photographs of, uh, I think, people basically in pain, dealing with really hard things of some kind. Maybe they're you know wounded or medically hurt or starving or you know different pictures like this. And they hooked people up to a complex EEG machine, I think QEEG. So it's following maybe 10 or 12 different sites on the skull. Pardon me for not knowing the exact number. Um, and they just watch what happens in the brain when somebody looks at these things. And all kinds of empathy things light up. And they show in their brains signs of pain. Then they teach them for only an hour, here's what loving kindness is like from the Buddhist 
perspective. This is how you offer love to folks. Um, and then they show those people a series of pictures. This is now the experimental group. And what they showed was instead of pain lighting up in the brain, love light up in the brain. Literally, they would look at someone in pain and they could feel something that might feel good. Well, that would have a huge bearing on all of this stuff that I've experienced and that she's studying because, in effect, that's what we're doing. Like, whether, even for the seeds, people are 10 minutes hard as they can providing, you know, light and grow, grow, grow messages to these little seeds. Um, and, you know, whether it's a violent neighborhood or, you know, a violent part of the Middle East, like people are doing the same in the peace experiments too. And it may explain a whole lot of what was going on in their brains. Nowadays, if I don't happen to have a, you know, an intention time set up with my, my buddies from my group, um, where, you know, we'll say everybody's going to get on at 10 o'clock on Sunday night and here are all the things we're going to hold intentions for. Um, or maybe it's just one big thing. Um, if I'm not doing it that way, sometimes what I'll do in my mind is, uh, I will sit down and I will gather, um, the masters. Totally imaginary, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But Jesus and Buddha and, you know, and on around the circle are, are the greats. Maybe it's St. Michael. Maybe it's my guides and angels. Maybe it's my loving and wonderful grandfathers, whatever. Um, and we'll sit in a circle and we'll hold an intention in mind together. And there's something about that that I find more powerful than me just holding it alone. Mm -hmm. But when I've done it, just holding me at it alone, that feels really good too. Hmm. So maybe she's just stumbled on to a way to bring in the effects that have all been well measured and documented elsewhere. What's curious about it is that in only 10 minutes, she's able to get effects in the actual brain, the measurable effects that look a whole lot more like really advanced meditation states. And that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think the you know, you, the places where I stumble, right? Because I, I know and, and have a, I, I have a sense of the things that, that work inside me. And when I'm feeling good and gracious and generous, uh, you know, I find that to be a great catharsis. I, I don't have enough to, to, to swing me uh, to the, um, the, the externalities of it, right? The, the things that are, uh, I mean, you just said there's well and documented, uh, research around, you know, the plants. I just feel like I don't have enough. I don't have enough there. That that yeah. research, I start poking around, and I can start seeing holes in uh, from from others who who start poking holes in some of that. And so, I, maybe there's something there. Uh, I'm just I'm not over the hump. Oh, for sure, man. I mean, it, and you shouldn't be if if what we're looking for is just the answer. Um, I think you're more fundamentally oriented toward answers and and I more toward questions. And that's beautiful. We we tend to get along really well. Like yeah. We find people who are built the other way and, and it makes for really cool stuff. Answerers are really good at coming up with great questions. But part of it is because like – you're not you. You will ask damn good questions till you get to a really solid answer. Um, and we don't have a solid answer on this stuff. You're no. exactly right. But that's part of the process in my mind. To me, that doesn't you know then de like disqualify her as a participant in this conversation. It just means I think of her as having a particular role. She's here to make a whole lot of noise. Maybe even make a whole lot of money while she does it, which makes everyone even more nervous, and that's fine. Right. That's a, that's yet another <clears throat> onion layer of the blooming onion. Layer of the onion. Sure, yeah. she's going to do very well for herself doing this. Um, she'll sell a bunch of books and get a lot of interest, and in, you know everybody will tune in to Lynn McTaggart. May we um, all be so lucky. Exactly. <laughs> I'm kind of okay with that. <laughs> I think I'm going to raise a whole lot of questions with this podcast and, you know, 
statistically, it's much more likely to be a whole lot quieter operation than she ever has. But let's say it went gigantic and that did very well for us. I might still have a role of just raising some really interesting questions for other mm -hmm. people to pin down. Right. So I think it's it's good that she's she is spending some time. But it, all of these things, as they always do, if you're going to come to some scientific clarity, like some new principle everyone can count on, have to be replicated a million times over. Yeah. The thing that's interesting, though, is, and we because you know our. Our talk got, went on too long, and I don't. We didn't feel like she spoke about this part quite clearly enough that it was a compelling part to include in the interview. Some of these things have been replicated a lot. Um, there have been folks doing decades of research on, you know, random event generators and random number generators, things they would call cowboy and Indian studies, and where they would ask people to look at something that's just generated randomly by a computer and ask them to see if they could get the computer to do to show them more pictures of, let's say, Indians than cowboys or the other way around, or more heads than tails or the other way around. And from what I understand and read, the effect is pretty impressive. Um, that's weird. That's really weird. But Be because is it fundamentally, that's not how computers work. Right. <laughs> not the way they're supposed to work. Yeah. That's not yeah. the way they're supposed to work. But there is a lot I mean, of data around there. If you look at random random number generators like that are stationed around the planet, when huge events happen in human history, like 9-11, they get weirdly coherent. Shouldn't be possible. They are supposed to stay completely random. But that's not Lynn's research. That's entirely unrelated to her. And they're finding that stuff elsewhere. What's going on there? Yeah, what is what is going on there? And again, like... There, I, I feel like I'm in a position of more harder questions on what those observations are coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so we should be questioning both things. We should be questioning the source. Yeah. But my concern is that we can, we all get really good at questioning the source. We get so good at disqualifying the source that we can't learn anything new. Oh, we don't yeah. We're, this is the age some... of disqualifying the source. We're in right. the age of it. Yeah. Right. But every major paradigm shift in science has come from a source that everybody wanted to tear apart every right. time. I mean, Einstein, now venerated, was not appreciated immediately. Newton had to invent his own mathematics just to prove some of his theories. He was no scientist to people. They thought he was absolutely full of it. Galileo, right. God, that's a famous one. Like how many scientists have we had along the way that have raised some really interesting questions, done their best to put it out there, and it took a lot of years before a whole lot of people said, got curious enough to then back it up. I'm not saying she's even the pioneer scientist here. She's just the one saying... All right, what if we got half a dozen scientists or 10 or 12 to try different studies and we got something? Would that be enough to get people interested to go further? More people asking more questions is a good thing. I think it's I think we thing. agree on that. And uh, uh, if she it, she she sort of um, fashions herself a gatekeeper of some of this, you know, this area. And um, there are many ways I struggle with that. Uh, that sort of mindset and mentality. And I think that exists at, at the collision of um, uh, commerce and public science. Um, sure. And, and I, I, I struggle with that m pretty mightily. Um, but I, I do think that if, if some of this insight spurs more experiments, more study, more research in, in these areas, it can't hurt. If anything, come back and say, you know, we've learned a lot about how the body works and how the brain works and, and consciousness science. Like we, we, we've learned a lot about neurology and um, what goes on when we think stuff. And maybe we learned that it just stops there. Maybe we need the the maybe it is a, a massive energetic intention connection. Maybe we learn that and confirm it. I, I think it's great. I think all of that is 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 great. I I wish 
<sighs> I don't even know what I wish for at this point. I I wish for... I wish I was uh, uh, more wired like you a little bit hmm. to, to, to be able to, uh, to greet this more openly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because I, you know, I, I wish I wasn't the sort of brick wall that I sometimes feel like, because you're right. I, I absolutely fall prey to the disqualification of sources. And, and I, I, you can hear me talking about this. I'm like so guarded in everything I say. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate it. You know, one of the things we, we talked about ahead of time as we were sort of working out, like, like how do we talk about this in a way that's both authentic and respectful, um, you know, of each other, of, of, of Lynn's of Lynn, work, for of, sure. of her of her courage out there because there's just no way in the world she's naive enough to think that if she writes a book like this, she's not going to just get slaughtered out there on the internet by somebody. Um, and she does. Um, one of the things I, we talked about was part of my living, part of my job is to sit with people who are imperfect messengers, right. who are indeed maybe showing up in my office, thoroughly screwing up their lives right now. And to be the guy who can say, yeah, but I believe there's a part of you that is ready to do something else. Or who right now are total jerks to their spouse because they really need to get sober or that's the best their depression lets them offer. And I have to believe in the part of them that can be kind and good until they can believe in that part too. Um, I spend a lot of time looking for a message that is worthy even if the messenger is flawed uh, and it takes a lot of practice to do but I also spend a lot of people a lot of time with people helping them um, get curious about possibilities that to them are a hell of a lot more impossible than anything Lynn McTaggart is suggesting things like I might be a decent person after all right yeah like in their lives, there's no way. They're not, they are absolutely yeah. clear. No they are not worthy. Them. You know, they are in absolutely outside the circle, as Victoria Castle would say. And the trance of scarcity is strong with this one. And I have to figure out <laughs> how to get them curious about a distant, miraculous possibility that life could be better than this when yeah. all their sources say there's no way. Yeah. When that is the standard wisdom, you know? Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I may be over-focused on that side, but there are also plenty of people who would tell you about me that I'm annoyingly skeptical, um, uh, with, <laughs> with the new idea. Like there are other places in my life where I will squint and be like, yeah, what about this? What about that? I don't know if this is a good idea. You know, can you, can you pick one of those out right now? I'd be curious oh, yeah. where you call yourself the skeptic. Yeah. Um, my dear wife regularly will come to me with a flawless business idea and I will say, that's awesome, honey. I can see you're super psyched. Can I ask a question? And usually now the answer is no, not right now. You may not ask a question. <laughs> you know, if she knows what she's doing, she will not let me ask that question because I am a question asker and she knows, you know, yeah. some of my questions are really hopeful ones and some of them are a little bit more despairing. Some of the time I go... Is there any chance this is going to work out just like this this other time, you know? <laughs> right. So yeah. that would be an example. Sometimes um somebody will come to me often a client who's wildly in love and I have to walk this interesting line where rather than immediately smash that idea because, you know, she's married uh to someone oh, else, let's say. I see. Yeah. Or <clears throat> um this person might have quite a tendency to fall hard and fast for somebody and we're just working on wait could we keep our balance under us just a little bit let's slow down some nope we don't have to throw up a brick wall it's okay lots of good feelings but let's just slow down a little bit you know sometimes that's not well received sometimes it's very much appreciated sometimes we have to say okay so it sounds like you already have a pretty good idea that this is going to go lots of directions that 
your prior relationships have gone, but you want to go there because you feel really good about this person. And they'll be like, yep, yeah, this is going to be a train wreck dodge. I just know it is, but I'm going. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's too late, man. My heart's attached. I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, let's see how this goes. Um, so sometimes I'm a skeptic in that way too. Yeah. Often I'm way too much of a skeptic in my own life. And I would really, really like, uh, I'd like to believe in bigger and you know, brighter possibilities for myself than I sometimes will allow. Well, and that I don't even know if that's if that skepticism or just that just innate kind of personal um, fear of unknown, right? And and love is also one of those areas that we you can say, "Oh, well, I'm a skeptic in love." Maybe you're just terrified. Maybe you've been burned. Maybe you've been whatever. Royal you, not you, Dodge. But yeah, uh, or maybe you, Dodge. I don't know. Um, and I, I feel like. That is absolutely at play here for me. Um, you know, I, years ago, I interviewed somebody on a podcast, and that person was in the uh, energetic and spiritual healing arts. And it turns out that it was all like economically motivated and that had, you know, the, this person's work had been wildly debunked and in some cases, this person had been caught like outright lying and mm. was still building this, like making a, just out of the sheer will of charisma, uh, was still building quite an empire. And, um, you know, in, in that case, I, I, I feel like I got burned. <laughs> mm. <laughs> this made me more conservative, uh, yes. in the things that I approach and allow in easily. Right. Yes. I, like I, I need more answers. I need more answers. I need more. I need multiple more convincing signals um, just because I've been burned. Yes. And you I'm would. okay with that. Absolutely. It's like people who've just been heartbroken in relationship after relationship or cheated on by every boyfriend they ever had. They get to a place where like it's really hard not to lead with the, you know, the burned. Yeah. The the singed edge, you know, starts um yeah, yeah, leading the way. And I don't I don't blame you a bit. Um and I've had I've had some real disappointments along the way myself. Like I really get that. Um and don't get me wrong, like, you know, as I read Lynn's stuff, like there is another part of me that's going, Well, what else could explain this? What else could be yes. going on? You know? And to me her re her writing follows that kind of like self-imposed skepticism much more than, you know, the condensed version where we're just having a galloping, playful conversation with a safe audience, you know, where she's mm -hmm. just – where I'm just going amazing. That's amazing. That's all I'm yeah. saying to her at that time. Yeah. Right. But yeah, th that's not to say I can't slow down and be like, huh, is this legit? What's going on here? And I guess maybe all of us wax and wane and sort of our – Belief in magic a little bit, you know, belief in things unseen and concepts not yet understood. Um, I have times where I, I really get it. It helps me when I think of her work to know that, you know, some of the most famous scientists speaking about the deeper nature of reality, when they're sort of looking at more like quantum levels, they end up finding themselves sounding a lot like spiritual sages. <laughs> they yeah. are talking about consciousness as a thing um, and a fascinating thing at that. Um, and, you know, what the, the Vedas of Hinduism would say going way back is like, the whole of reality, the whole universe is one huge thought. Like in um, – I think it's Paramahansa Yogananda talks about this idea that uh, in the same way that vapor condenses to water, condenses to ice, um, the whole universe is condensed thought. All of mm -hmm. this is just a function of consciousness and is subject to consciousness. <laughs> when the thought is powerful enough, um, it's affected by it. 
And I find that an incredibly beautiful and compelling idea, and I'm willing to wander into areas where people are asking cool questions about it and coming up with even the littlest early glimmers of answers about that. Um, and there were there are sure to be dead ends. And it takes a kind of willingness to encounter disappointment um, to to even want to go down those roads, kind of like it, love. It kind of like love. I I've been musing on this uh, lately. I've run into a, a member of the community who's a an engineer, and said something to me that that means a lot. Which is, um, you know, we have conditioned ourselves to f- to feel failure. Right to feel that that failure has let someone down, whether it's yourself or your colleagues or your peers or your mother. I don't know who you're letting down. You're letting somebody down when you fail. It's this huge capital F fail word. Uh, and he said, what you have to know is that in the study of science, the sciences and engineering, failure is simply a change state. Right. It's just it's just another gate that didn't get passed. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it is there is no emotion <laughs> attached to a failed state. It, it's just a zero versus a one. And that's OK. You learn from it and you try to find the next, you know, one uh, mm-hmm. and open the next gate in whatever you're trying to learn about. And I, I've been trying to think a lot more like that when something doesn't doesn't go right. It's not. If, if something I don't understand that is giving me like this conversation that is giving me fits about how to talk about it, it's it it might just be a gate that hasn't opened yet. And it doesn't have to be emotionally mm. weighty in the in so doing. Yeah, that's well said, man. I was talking with a group about this this morning. We were just talking about how heartbreaking life can be if you're really open to it. I mean, if you're open to kind of the full range of experience here and not guarded, um, sure. there's a lot of heartbreak to it. And it's beautiful. Um, it breaks that heart open in the end, but it's painful to, you know, to walk through the world open to that level of disappointment. Um, right. And... You know, believing in something or someone, believing in an idea, following the questions as far as you can often will go down these damn dead ends that suck. You know, believing in love or believing in, you know, um, business or believing in a dream or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, of course, where like – Every other person has got just ridiculous musical talent and has come here to follow some dream. And it's so poignant to work with them. I mean, the artist archetype is just full of heartbreak. <laughs> oh, so much. Um, and I I can appreciate, I mean, it's it's fair to have some cynicism about anybody who, who can make money um, – uh, exciting large groups of people about an idea. Um, I am cynical about a lot of versions of that out there. Mm-hmm. But so far, um, I've liked enough about what I see in Lynn McTaggart uh, to believe she is genuinely trying to make a contribution of some kind. And I also believe in the many scientists who've helped her who are not making any money doing it and not gaining any notoriety. If anything, they've risked their reputations to even be involved in such seedy, sure. you know, investigation. Seedy and, uh, investigation. You know, I mean, like, right? I mean, this is so beneath the ivory tower to yeah. imagine that you could change the pH level of a lake, for God's sake. Come on. Um, yeah. But there's some folks out there who've been willing to give it a try and – Good for them. I I hope yeah. they'll keep their integrity high and do their best to keep money from pushing them down roads that don't serve this beautiful question they are willing to ask. I hope so. And all that said, uh, I am still grateful that she would take the time to come and join this conversation with you and uh, allow us to yeah. have something like this to talk about. It's hard. It's hard. It's personally yeah. hard. It's probably it really the hardest was. thing that that we've done on this show, for sure, personally. Yeah. 
It, yeah, it's definitely the some of the hardest questions we've had we've wrestled with yet, and and one of the you know bigger names, so to speak, like uh, to to come and so generously join us, yeah. which is we appreciate everybody who's been here. Um, this was it was kind of her to to take some time and make a risk and trust me to hear her material in a gracious way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for, you know, being so hopeful. <laughs> thanks for being so grounded. <laughs> Love, Love you, buddy. man. <laughs> <laughs>